An arithmetic function is a function that is defined on some set of integers, and that set of integers is usually the natural numbers. The Euler phi function is an example of an arithmetic function that we've already seen a few times in this course. Here's a chart of the values of this function. We can notice that there is a pattern to the values of phi when considering just the primes. In each case, we see that phi of p is equal to p minus 1. This makes sense because all the positive integers less than p must be relatively prime to p, otherwise p would not be prime. With just a little bit of thought, we can actually derive the value of phi of p to the m following the same type of logic. Consider writing out the numbers from 1 to p to the m in a grid as shown here. First, notice that this is a grid of values that has p columns and p to the m minus 1 rows. The only numbers that are not relatively prime to p to the m are the multiples of p, which are the numbers contained in the rightmost column. This means all the other numbers are relatively prime to p to the m. This is a grid of values that's p minus 1 columns wide and p to the m minus 1 rows tall. This means that we can count the total number of values in the grid by multiplication. We will derive a general formula for phi of n in an indirect manner that highlights some of the interesting techniques that can be applied to problems involving arithmetic functions. We will start off with a somewhat surprising theorem. Theorem. The sum of phi of d, where d divides n, is equal to n. This is a different use of summation notation than before. Instead of sequentially counting up, we've generalized the notion to allow for a condition on the dummy variable. In this case, the sum runs through the natural numbers d that divide n. Here is an explicit example. And if we actually calculate the phi function for each of these values and add the result, we happen to get 12, just as the theorem says. We will use a combinatorial argument to prove this in general. Let s sub n denote the set of natural numbers from 1 to n. For each element k of s sub n, we're going to write down the GCD of k and n. Here's what it looks like for n equals 12. We will group each of these elements together based on these values, and let t sub d of n be the set of elements whose greatest common divisor with n is d. In general, we're just taking the elements of s sub n and putting them into groups. Therefore, this equation must be true. We will now determine the size of the set t sub d of n. First, notice that all the elements must be a multiple of d because of the GCD property. This means that we only need to consider this list of values. Let's focus on some specific element AD. If the GCD of AD and N is equal to D, then by dividing out the common factor of D from everywhere, we get the GCD of A and N over D is equal to 1. This means that an element of the form AD is in T sub D of N if and only if the GCD of A and N over D is 1, which is the exact same condition used in the Euler phi function. Therefore, we can say that the size of the set T sub D of N is equal to phi of N over D. The last observation is that as the sum cycles through all the divisors of n, the values n over d also cycle through all the divisors of n. Here are some numerical examples that demonstrate this. This observation allows us to rewrite the final sum without the fraction and proves the result. The last step is a very common trick when working with these sums. There's a more formal demonstration of this, but it tends to be less helpful than just working through some numerical examples. In the next video, we will introduce a new arithmetic function called the Mobius function. This initially strange looking function turns out to have some very useful properties. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future.